All right, well, it's my pleasure to be here with uh, Dr. Tony Schreri. Um, Tony is the director of the Lang Center for General Urinary Oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And obviously, he's no, uh, no stranger to anyone who knows, follows kidney cancer. So thank you for taking the time to talk to thank me today. Thank you, Brian. Um, so obviously, there's a lot that's happening at ESMO. It was just a year ago that you presented the initial data on Cabo Sun. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about Cabo Sun at ESMO. I was wondering if you could just comment on the new data that's presented regarding Cabo Sun and regarding progression free survival and any updates on overall survival and how you think Cabo's antidote's role in renal cell is going to progress as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, interesting enough, you know, we presented that data in the plenary session of 2016 ESMO in Copenhagen, and uh, the analysis was investigator assessed. But what we did um, last year that we start collecting the scan, and we collected scans on 156 out of 157 patients, almost everyone. And uh, similar to the um, investigator review, the independent radiologic review showed that the primary endpoint was met. The progression-free sur survival you know, of sunitinib was superior, was clinically relevant, and statistically significant. And actually, the hazard ratio was better and was lower at 0 0.48, so you have a 52% chance of, uh, you know, better progression or uh, uh, progression-free survival with cabozantinib. Uh, remember, though, uh, this is in patients with uh, uh, poor risk and intermediate risk by the IMDC criteria. We didn't include patients with good risk uh, patients, so this is good. Uh, the rate of tumor shrinkage in the 80s with Cabo, in the 50s with sunitinib. We look at updated toxicity. Both drugs has uh, somewhat similar toxicity profile. Mm -hmm. That's the anti-VEGF toxicity profile, the fatigue, the diarrhea, the hypertension, and foot skin reaction. Uh, we did the, an update uh, of overall survival, and the hazard ratio was trending. It was less than 1, 0 0.8. The study was not really powered to detect an overall survival benefit, though numerically there was around five months uh, overall survival mm -hmm. benefit. So we're very excited with the study uh, and the study result. And um, hopefully cabozentinib will become uh, one of the options in uh, untreated uh, RCC patient of intermediate and poor risk mm -hmm. disease. Right, well, speaking of <laughs> options with Checkmate 214, it seems like there's could be a significant change in the way we approach patients with renal cell, particularly those with poor and intermediate risk disease. I was wondering, could you comment about what you see the future of frontline renal cell immunotherapy given the survival benefits seen? Absolutely. With Only a few weeks ago, we saw a press release showing that uh, uh, one out of two and out of two and three planned uh, endpoints was uh, uh, pre-planned endpoints were met so overall response rate was higher the progression free survival uh, benefit was not met and here we go only a few weeks later uh, overall survival benefit in the intermediate and poor risk uh, categories again by IMDC uh, and um, uh, interesting uh, enough um, you know the events were met so this could well be a pure IO-IO combination that will take over the frontline uh, setting and becomes the standard. This is an overall survival benefit, and this is a phase three well-powered trials. So of course, the question here, like in melanoma, uh, the toxicity profile, uh, how are we gonna be able to manage? Uh, do we need to go only into experience centers or not? But this is very exciting. Every year we have something you know, new in RCC, many new things. So uh, uh, at the end of the day, what I think, Brad, these are all um, great question in terms of what to sequence, what to choose. But for patients, we're having new drugs, new combination. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have no doubt that several years down the line, when we look at these large databases, like we did a few years ago, the survival, the median overall survival of the patient is, you know, um, going to be more and more. With interferon, it was a year. With VEGF target therapy, we reach a little over three years. Now we have nivolumab, cabozentinib, nivolumab plus um, ipilimumab, and hopefully other combinations, you know, were presented. And that's pushing and pushing the envelope. 
and uh, more patients with uh, metastatic disease can live longer. And hopefully, with immunotherapy, a subset of them are going to be cured and have long-term durable responses, those responses with quality, right? Well, not everything at ESMO was new for kidney cancer. And one of the oldest questions that we've been addressing is the role of cytoreductive nephrectomy. And so at ESMO, they presented data on the SIR time regarding the role of immediate versus deferred cytoreductive nephrectomy. And I wonder what your thoughts are. Is there still a role for cytoreductive nephrectomy? And is there a clear preference towards immediate versus deferred surgery? Absolutely. One of the few things that's not related to immuno-oncology, asking an important question. And, uh, you know, for every meeting I've been to uh, that um, works around cytoreductive nephrectomy paradigm in terms of trial, the third time and the Carmina, the third time is delayed versus immediate cytoreductive nephrectomy coupled with sunitinib, you know, uh, in a sequential matter, versus the Carmina trial, both out of Europe, uh, which is no cytoreductive nephrectomy, sunitinib versus uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy followed by sunitinib. And here we go, Axel Bax from the Netherlands present the data for a certain time. The first thing is that I want to congratulate those uh, folks who are able, you know, to um, enroll on this study. Still, the numbers were small, and it's hard to interpret, you know, uh, what happened. But at least, you know, we know it's feasible. You know, it's feasible and um, immediate cytoreductive nephrectomy versus deferred shouldn't matter. Uh, deferred cytoreductive nephrectomy is an option. At the end of the day, the question for cytoreductive nephrectomy is it's not for everyone. Uh, large retrospective studies, even the earlier prospective studies, really uh, taught us a lot that patient with good performance status who can really go to the OR, have anesthesia, and get the kidney removed, patient without brain metastases, with a uh, expected uh, life expectancy, with a you know a life expectancy that is you know not in the few months range. And we looked at that in the IMDC uh, database, patients with short life expectancy who have significant number of IMDC risk factor. I mean, they not, they're not going to benefit. Uh, so um, important addition to the literature, yes, delayed cytoreductive nephrectomy is possible. It did not answer the question whether it's better. And in my practice, I have, uh, you know, for the right fit patient that present with metastatic disease, I practice immediate cytoreductive nephrectomy in the, you know, obviously fit patient. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, again, this is Dr. Tony Schreri from Dana-Farber. Thank you, Brad.